Okay, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Dan. Uh, I'm going to hold my notes. Uh, <laughs> so, by way of introduction, I'm an attorney. I practice mass defense and what I call resistance law. That's law related to mass protests and mass gatherings. Uh, I am also a street medic and a street medic trainer, and I was an EMT basic for a number of years. So, I was actually trying to find somebody to uh, locally to do this part of the talk. And it's a pretty obscure set of intersecting areas of law that come together. So there's uh, health policy law, and there's medical malpractice law, and there's <coughs> professional licensure law, and there's the type of law that I do, which is mass defense and mass gathering law. And little bits and pieces of these all play into this. Uh, most of what I'll talk about today will use New York law. I'm going to start with a qualification that I always start with, which is that I'm not licensed to practice law in New York State. I'm not your attorney. This is not legal advice. <laughs> <laughs> Don't act on it as such. And especially if you're watching out there in internet land, I'm really not your attorney. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> with that said, um, so that I know, and, and I would echo what Juliana said, which is that I'm more than happy to be interrupted and take questions, clarifications. When we do the street medic training, one of the things that we talk about is hold us accountable as your trainers. So if you hear something that doesn't resonate or that doesn't make sense, do interrupt. Do ask a question on that. Um, sources for laws. So New York State, I don't know if y'all have ever been there, but it's a little Byzantine and a little strange. Uh, you, you have two major sources of law to look to. Uh, one is the New York public health law. And in particular, I will write this. Uh, so the New York public health law, and you want to particularly look at basically in the 3000 section, <laughs> right? Um, so in particular there, um, that actually, section 3000 starts with the Good Samaritan law. So everybody's probably basically heard of that. Believe it or not, you all are covered by the Good Samaritan Law when you're not acting within the normal scope of your practice. So when you're not, uh, you're not a resident, when you're not in a hospital or in a clinical setting, if you get back on the subway tonight and you're going home and somebody there, you decide to treat somebody or try to help somebody, uh, and that's, you're not getting paid for it and you, don't, you do it voluntarily and without the expectation of monetary compensation, uh, as long as you don't act with gross negligence, in other words, totally foul it up, you'll be covered by the Good Samaritan Law. What that really means is they can't sue you and win. Okay, and win is the underlying part. There. <laughs> <laughs> they can still sue you. Uh, you'll just win. Doesn't that only cover things that fall within the realm of what you're competent to do? And as yep. like residents, like how does that... I mean, are we competent to do anything? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great question, right? I mean, if, if, you're, if you're, you know, a third year ER resident, then you're probably competent to do a whole lot. Uh, if, if you're a first year resident in, in the first rotation that you're doing, uh, then you're probably not. And, and, and that would get into that, you know, you have to provide care that's not negligent and it's not grossly negligent. You will meet, need to make a decision for yourself about what is potentially negligent where you're acting outside of your areas of competence. So, um, at least because I'm studying for the boards right now, mm -hmm. and they do have lots of you know, questions on Good Samaritan Law. And from what I've been reading, you're not covered under Good Samaritan Law if you're providing, if you're volunteering health care services, for example, like at a children's softball game, or you're at like a New York marathon or something, then you're not covered because you're volunteering services and so you're, you're potentially liable. It's different for like a car accident. So all this stuff is going to vary dramatically from state to state. Uh, what, what I can tell you is outside of the context of a doctor's office or any other place having proper and necessary medical equipment. So if you've got proper and necessary medical equipment and the skills and competence to utilize it at the softball game or you know at the aid tent at the New York Marathon, then yes, you're probably not going to be covered in that context, uh, in the context of, of talking about being street medics, you almost certainly don't have the, the resources and the physical infrastructure uh, there. That being said, I'm looking at New York Public Health Law, Article 30, Section 3000. Uh, I'm not looking at the, you know, the USMLE that might be talking broadly across the nation. Uh, and, and state by state, the stuff really is gonna vary dramatically. Another, what I was about to talk about is the other major source uh, that you need to look to. 
which, because y'all are in New York, it's the New York State <laughs> Education Law. Can you believe that? Yes, really. Um, <laughs> so the New York State Education Law, particularly starting around section <laughs> 6530, um, that actually speaks to what constitutes professional misconduct for physicians, physicians assistants, and other licensees, which incidentally, yes, residents are covered under this. So there were three things in particular that I decided to pull out of there that are really pertinent. Uh, that being said, y'all really should go read this because you're subject to it. Right now, tomorrow, if, if you go out to do your resident thing, whatever residency you're in, you are subject to these laws. So it's a good idea to know what they say. Uh, section 11 of, or subsection 11 of that section is you are prohibited, or it amounts to professional misconduct, to permit, aid, or abet an unlicensed person in an act which requires a license. So you can't help an unlicensed street medic, uh, an unlicensed physician or an unlicensed paramedic or uncertified EMT to do something that requires a license. Uh, it's hard to come up with specific examples of, of where this might come up, but they're out there. And often people will look to the physician and defer to you. And Juliana talks some about that, but people will say, oh, we do have a doctor. Let's go get the doctor. If, if you feel competent and capable to take care of that patient uh, with all the responsibilities that come from that ethically and professionally for you as physicians, uh, you <coughs> just need to make sure that you don't then transfer care to a lesser trained person. That constitutes abandonment. Uh, you will be liable potentially for that professionally and possibly you know, in, in a civil lawsuit. You can't similarly delegate your professional responsibilities to somebody who you know or should know uh, that they don't have the licensure, training, or experience to perform. Uh, you, uh, section 47 is my favorite. It's actually professional misconduct to fail to use proper barriers, to fail to use proper infection control barriers. So yeah, really, uh, gloves, you know, mask, face, eye protection as, as appropriate. Uh, I hope you all, you know, glove up every time you go treat a patient clinically, but it's actually professional misconduct to fail to do that. So that's an interesting part of your New York State law. Um, the uh, public health law at section 230 speaks to what the possible penalties are for professional misconduct. And they run on a spectrum from private censure or basically getting a slap on the wrist in effect from the, from the authorities to suspension to revocation. Uh, and there are various ways that you can be reinstated to practice medicine again, uh, sometimes with a practice mentor, sometimes being limited to certain types of medical practice. Um, okay, medical records. Basically, uh, they don't really apply here. Overwhelmingly, street medics and street medic programs will not be maintaining medical <coughs> records. Uh, if you are maintaining medical records, though, you need to do those consistent with all the other training, and I'm sure that you all have had to sit through trainings on how to maintain proper medical records. Uh, street medics overwhelmingly are not going to be maintaining them. And there's actually a good reason for that. In protest situations, it can be chaotic, it can be loud, it can be messy, and it can be very hard to maintain good, proper medical records. Uh, and what you really don't want is identifying information, patient information, treatment, uh, you know, the objective assessment, the treatment plan, and oops, then you lost it. Uh, that's really bad for them. So not maintaining medical records is important. Um, okay. Similarly... One, yeah. one potential exception for that are injuries associated with arrests. And for those, you want to document the injuries, and it helps substantially to have um, a, me a licensed medical provider do that documentation. Yeah, and, and from the legal <coughs> support side, which I do a lot of as well, uh, it's important for us to have that for police brutality, uh, civil litigation, as well as criminal defense support. Um, HIPAA mostly is not going to apply in, in the street medic context because that is a, that the HIPAA privacy rule applies when you are maintaining, transmitting, uh, or saving medical records in electronic form. You're not going to be overwhelmingly in street medic practice. You're not going to be maintaining the stuff or transmitting it electronically. Uh, arrest, and, and we went into this a little bit before with, with police targeting street medics. It is exceptionally rare it does happen. Some street medics who are friends of mine who I uh, train with, 
were arrested in North Carolina about a month and a half ago acting solely as street medics. It is possible. Uh, it is something that police will use as a tactic to try to disrupt the demonstration. Uh, police have been training since Seattle, since 1999 with the WTO protests, in ways of disrupting uh, demonstrations. And one of those is to headhunt. One of those is to go after the organizers, to go after the infrastructure. Uh, so do be aware, while it is unlikely, and we have very few examples in the last decade of it happening, that it is possible that you could be targeted. Uh, generally, you know when you're going to get arrested. And generally, you're going to have the option to uh, step back from that. New York City, as it happens, is one of those relative exceptions uh, where they have this nasty habit of cordoning off three or 400 people and you know, pushing them into an alley or a street <coughs> and blocking it off with construction fencing on those sides, which I've had happen to me here in New York City. Um, but generally, you know. If you're moving out of state, or if you're going out of state to be a street medic, understand that you will be subject both to the laws of your state, uh, the state of New York, as well as possibly the laws of the state that you're going to. And I mention this because a lot of street medic work is travel based. I acted in June as a street medic on a week long march in West Virginia. Uh, were I still a certified EMT, I would have been subject both to the rules and laws in that case of Alaska, which is where my last certification was, as well as potentially West Virginia. For you all as physicians, you need to look very carefully at whether what you're doing amounts to practicing medicine without a license in the state that you happen to be in. So if you agree to go to New Jersey or Connecticut uh, to, to help with something and you're licensed in New York State, uh, you would do very well to look into the laws of those states where you're going. Make sure that you're not going to cross over lines there. Um, I have a few other quick things, and a couple of them are actually follow-ups. One of the things that in street medic training that we talk about is good self-care, both for ourselves as activists, as resources to the protest, and organizers are notoriously bad at good self-care. They're notoriously neglectful of themselves. They don't... He's looking at me right they now. They don't <laughs> sleep enough. Uh, they don't hydrate enough, they don't eat well, they don't engage in good psychological self-care. One of the most important things that street medics can and should do is what we sometimes refer to as bring the peace, bring the calm. Be that person in a chaotic, scary, dangerous situation who brings calm to it. Uh, and it, it's kind of a feedback loop. When you bring calm, the people around you will be more calm and it'll self-perpetuate. Um, a, a, a brief follow-up on, on the tear gas piece and the research around it. One of the things that's complicated about it is that most of these companies producing these less lethal munitions, because I reject the use of the term non-lethal, uh, they're just less lethal and they do sometimes kill people, uh, are uh, incredibly proprietary about the actual ingredients, the actual chemical makeup of their little proprietary blend of tear gas. Uh, so we kind of don't really know, for the most part, what's in them. There are definitely known toxins. There are definitely known carcinogens in some of these formulations of tear gas. I agree that we don't know long term, we don't have the, the data in place to know what the impacts of those are going to be. But just be aware that there's a lot of different nasty chemicals out there. Other injuries that didn't get mentioned that are really unique to protest situations, you'll see blunt force trauma from really unique mechanisms. You'll see beanbag guns, which literally shoot a beanbag about the size of my fist. You'll see rubber bullets, which can do incredible damage. Uh, so the, these less lethal uh, munitions. You'll see blunt force trauma from batons a lot that, that you wouldn't normally see in another non-protest law enforcement context. Tasers. Tasers. Yeah, and so th this just illustrates the point that if you want to be a street medic, we want you to be and we would love you to get trained to do it. There, there are definitely things that you're not learning and there's no reason for you to learn in your normal hospital rotations as residents or at working as attendings. Uh, th there are injuries that, that are so unique to protests that you really do need the further training. And then the last thing that I, that I just wanted to note is at least with the folks who I have learned how to train from and am training with, law is actually no longer something that we are training on. Uh, where we are not training, yeah, we're training straight water eye flushes. Um, so it, this just illustrates the point that there's a lot of diversity out there. Um, <coughs> there, there are folks who have trained in the past uh, for using 
uh, certain uh, topicals to get irritants off of the skin. Mofiba. Yeah. Mineral oil followed immediately by alcohol. And oh. that, and, and so yeah, it's mineral oil which will bond chemically to the irritants, but it has to be followed immediately by alcohol and or immediately by a really full scale water flush. And in the field, we often just don't have those options. So those, you know, those things aren't there. So it's, it's just to illustrate the point that there is a lot of diversity out there. I think there are very exciting opportunities for you as <coughs> physicians to plug in to street medic work, and I hope you do. It is definitely not uh, something that you're being trained on. And as Juliana was saying, the, the non-hierarchical structure, the, the sort of horizontalized structure that you will exist in, is something that's going to be different. It's, it's a different kind of experience and a different way to be a medical provider. Um, I will. I think I'll finish up and take questions or comments or clarifications from y'all if you have. And if you don't have any, I must have done such a great comprehensive <laughs> job <laughs> that there are no questions left. Oh, there are. Does it does it matter legally if you're going to a protest with the idea that you're going to provide healthcare and you're a healthcare professional, as opposed to with Good Samaritan Laws, if something just happens, you haven't planned to provide any health mm -hmm. services. The way that I read Section 3000, no. The, the, there's not a meaningful difference whether you go with that intent or you get on the subway with the intent to go home or you're walking down Jerome Avenue and you see something that, you know, that requires response. Uh, that again is New York specific, and that's just the way I'm reading your Good Samaritan law. Uh, it could be different in Georgia, it could be different elsewhere. Um, the question about malpractice, um, <laughs> I wasn't sure if you had any insights into that. Next, I would be interested if you have any experience with lawsuits that happened um, in this setting. We know, so malpractice is, the, is a great question. Uh, your malpractice insurance will be extremely specific to your insurer, your policy, your underwriter, and the ones that I've seen or talked to people about have really been expressly for the scope of work that you engage in. So you're an internal resident, me medicine resident you know, at Montefiore Hospital. That your medical malpractice insurance is going to cover you for that. It's not gonna cover you for moonlighting at the urgent care clinic. It's not going to cover you for, uh, if you do internal medicine, for dabbling in psychiatry. So you really need to look at your policy uh, very specifically and, and look in particular at the exclusions. To answer the question, and I would send it back to other presenters as well, no. I am not aware of, I have never <coughs> heard of somebody being sued for med mal strictly for acting as a street medic. I'm sure it's happened. You know, it, 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 it's oh. probably out there, but I haven't heard of it in also roughly seven or eight years of, of doing this stuff. Oh, actually. No. Maybe. Yeah, I, There's one case outside the country I can think of, but it's not really pertinent. So. Okay. And, and I think, yeah, I've never heard of anything either. And so a couple thoughts. One is a lot of physicians, not a lot, but some physicians even in the regular practice choose to go bare, to not even carry medical malpractice insurance. Um, I think another thought is thinking about who you're providing care to. And even with the long-term encampments, a lot of activists and a lot of other people that are kind of drawn to Occupy work are just exceedingly grateful to have anybody providing them some medical care. And so you're, the type of community you're engaging with, I think, doesn't have a high likelihood of suing anyway. Um, so that's something to consider. And I would also liken it to my legal malpractice, which is a fascinating conversation to have every year when I renew it and to explain again what it is that I do. <laughs> yeah, I represent political protesters and uh, you know people who kind of want to get arrested and go do prison witness and stuff. Um, but activists don't sue their lawyers. It, it, it is, is almost an across the board truth. And, and I think that there's probably an, an analogous uh, you know, expectation that activists generally are not going to sue their medical providers. Again here though, and this kind of came up at the beginning of, of, the, of my little talk, you've got to be acting competently and not negligently and within the scope of care that you are actually qualified to provide. And so if, if you're a, you know, 
third year podiatry resident, you are extraordinarily skilled in one particular type of surgery. Uh, our running joke in our household has long been that I'm in charge of trauma because I did do pre-hospital medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so even though we have a licensed physician in the house, I'm, I'm the one sort of in charge of, of trauma response in the house. Don't act outside the scope of your competence, your practice, your understanding uh, ever, but also as a street medic. Question? Um, yes, my question was that in instances where there are like protests or clashes with police, which you know happens in your, not, not infrequently, and as a physician, you you know you witness something that could potentially be dangerous. Do you have at all any of the law back you up to go into that situation, or does the police trump that, which it invariably acts like it does? What I think I hear your question is: is do you, as a medical provider, have the have an ability to not obey a lawful order or not obey an order to disperse? Yeah. Okay, no, mm -hmm. is the short answer, uh, and. Uh, Certified and licensed medical personnel who are actually on staff uh, in the cities. Part of why street medics are such an important piece of protest support is that overwhelmingly uh, municipal and contracted EMS will not enter a scene until the cops tell them it's safe to do so. Certainly when I worked on the ambulance in Springfield, we did not enter scenes, Springfield Mass, some number of years ago, we did not enter scenes that were considered unsafe. We would go to the incident commander on scene and say, you know, is it safe for us to go in there? And whether that was uh, police or fire, if they said no, we'd say, okay, we're going to chill right over there. Let us know. Uh, so, no, you don't have any sort of special privilege to be present there. Might you be able to uh, convince a jury or a judge or a hearing officer on some little traffic misdemeanor ticket, uh, obstructing a roadway, say, is it going to be potentially persuasive to say, I'm you know, a physician and I was acting as a street medic and I went in to take care of a patient. And so I appreciate that there was this broad order you know, to disperse from the area or to not block this street. I felt like I had a greater duty as a physician uh, to, to help a patient who was clearly in need. It, it's not, strictly speaking, going to win the day legally, but it certainly could be persuasive depending on who the judge, the jury, the hearing officer is. I'm sort of related to I don't really feel like I have a good sense of what may or may not constitute a police police brutality, and so I was wondering if you could really comment you have on that. I know it's a mm -hmm. tough, it's context dependent, but I would liken it to uh, an epidemic, and an epidemic, which, as I ask my epidemiologist wife Pretty sometimes, funny. what is an epidemic really? <laughs> And, 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 and correct me if I'm wrong. Outbreak is even better. It's harder to define outbreak than it is. Okay. But, but, but it's more disease than you would expect in a given population, <laughs> right? And so in the context of police brutality, uh, more physical force, more use of force or chemical weapons <coughs> or projectile weapons than you would expect as necessary in a given situation. Uh, if you have a, a very extreme protest and, and you have protesters actually using physical violence towards police, generally they can get away with more or less a proportionate level of response. Overwhelmingly in the United States, particularly in progressive and leftist and peace and justice or <coughs> protests and things like Occupy, there are explicit norms in place to act nonviolently. Uh, and so the fact that police officers are using chemical weapons and projectile weapons against people who are acting peacefully, uh, I consider to be a disproportionate and, and unnecessary use of force and to constitute police brutality. Whether you're going to win in a lawsuit against the city of New York for what's called a Section 1983 claim, um, that's hard to say. You know, it's, it's going to be very fact specific. Uh, but yeah, generally more force than is necessary to uh, control the person or the situation. And fundamental to uh, police response to protest is dispersal, is crowd control. They, they want the protest to go away. You know, and, and so a disproportionate force is definitely a major tool in the toolbox for them. I have a question and then sort of a question comment. So the first question relates to a jail, visiting people in jail. And is that part of the work in the street medics? Short answer is no, uh, but there's an important corollary follow-up in a lot of actions where street medics will be available when they're released, mm -hmm. uh, wh which is to both do a sort of general screening to provide follow-up care, but also to really ask about and look for injuries that are particular to arrests, look for handcuff injuries, uh, look for <coughs> blunt force trauma and document it early. 
So visiting in jail, no, I'll, I'll have more opportunity as a lawyer than as a street medic to go visit people in jail. But sometimes, yeah, I'll put on my other hat and say, by the way, you know, did you get beaten up by the cops? Do you have physical <coughs> injuries? Make sure when you come out that you do talk to the street medic team uh, and, and let's get documentation of that. And ideally, um, <coughs> in an activist event or community where arrests are likely or have happened, there's also a jail support group that is helping the people who have been arrested, um, staying in touch with them, making sure that they're getting what they need, um, potentially advocating for medical care while they're in jail, and also helping to work with the medics to document injuries and so on. Yeah, and so there definitely is a role for the medic team ongoing. If, if they're going to be in jail for any kind of length of time, which to me is anything more than overnight, uh, advocating for good medical care within the facility and you know trying to make sure that the facility is, is doing their job. Now, if the facility is a, you know, a fenced off uh, pier at Chelsea Piers, then gosh, you know, not much going to happen there. If, if the facility, however, is Rikers Island, they certainly have the facilities, and then it's... Uh, an uphill battle to get them to actually utilize those facilities and do their job. So the other comment just related to looking at what was going on in the 60s when the, there was the People's March to Washington mm -hmm. DC, there was a committee set up, the Department of Health participated, several physician groups participated, there were special laws passed allowing physicians from other states to come and get temporary licenses, presumably somebody paid for malpractice insurance, maybe it was the city that covered them. Um, so it seemed like things were much more organized at that time. I mean, do you think that do, do you think that we don't have that now? We should create it. Is it possible to create more of a structure? I think it's possible, and it could be a very effective complementary structure to create in addition to the less organized, more horizontal structures that we have with street medic collectives uh, around the U.S. Uh, I think it could be a very, very powerful complementary piece to that. Um, I, I don't know that it should displace or replace what exists now. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know, the street medic community in the last 12 or so years since the WTO protests in Seattle, you know, there was a lot of interest and there were several major protest events after that in uh, Quebec, in Miami, in different places. A lot of activity, a lot of energy sort of tailed off. Uh, so now with Occupy and this upcoming year, we have the RNC, the DNC, and the GHG20 is meeting in Chicago. Uh, so, so there are all these mass protest events for which we certainly need more street medics, more legal support, more jail support, more people, you know, more kitchen, uh, more trash detail. Uh, and so could this be a very powerful and very positive complement to that if there was a more formalized structure of physicians, you know, to provide physician level care? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I don't want to make us run too far over, so <coughs> maybe start with the folks who haven't asked a question yet. Yeah, I, just uh, interesting observation from Matt, and as another gray beard in the room who's been running around in the streets since the 60s. Um, my sense is that there's a difference in the quality of this um, where the um, medical presence is much more integrated and almost underground um, and invisible and sort of pops up when it's needed and disappears again um, as compared to what we had in the 60s which was I think more structured but more position based more identified and probably not as tightly integrated with with the, with the protest action itself so people right. were identified more as doctors coming to observe or assist with a protest rather than as protesters mm -hmm. with medical skills who might or might not be doc probably weren't doctors but just had skills that were really relevant to the needs of the of the protest and it seems like a real evolution to me and it's uh, it's impressive mm -hmm. maybe another couple of quick questions and then we'll try to wrap up for y'all and I'm certainly happy to stick around afterwards and talk more I'm just I'm sensitive to folks might have places to go the video probably only needs to run so long so I guess I just I don't get to Lawyers talk, and so I was just oh, was curious, really, on, on what basis are, because you see people getting get arrested constantly, and you know we have a constitutional right to gather assembly yeah. protests, and so like, as far as even just like counseling people who actually, which not all protests, but want to avoid arrest, like on what basis is the police actually arrested? 
Uh, I mean, the charges you're seeing are obstruction of an officer, obstruction of public order, disorderly conduct, failure to obey a lawful order, uh, blocking a public street or public conveyance. There, there, there's a, a dozen or so really common charges that can be used. The <coughs> deeply unjust thing, in my opinion, is that they are being used uh, to, to quash free speech. That, that there, there's really not a concern. The, the park that we're in in, in Atlanta has for <clears throat> several decades been a place where homeless folk and housing insecure folk slept. And so the no camping in the park after 11 ordinance is one that the city of Atlanta is using against Occupy Atlanta that was certainly never enforced before. Uh, and, and it's now being <coughs> enforced as, to, and, and I don't mean to say, and I don't mean to imply that you know, boo-hoo, the activists are getting treated worse than the homeless. The homeless are certainly more marginalized and more impoverished overwhelmingly than most occupiers are. But that, that ordinance that they're using to clear that park is this ordinance has been on the books, you know, for, for years and years and years and was just never applied. Disorderly conduct charges are on the books, but rarely applied. And so uh, there's no legal exception to the fact that it's like an organized assembly? Potentially there's, there's a First Amendment defense uh, and, and this gets kind of into an obscure area of legal philosophy, but we have this whole problem with the fact that we don't actually have positivist rights under the Constitution. We have negativist rights, which means that we only get to assert them once they've been violated. They're, they're not affirmative. They're not out there. I, I don't have a First Amendment you know, force field around me. <laughs> if, if I get arrested you know, in violation of my First Amendment rights, then I can try to assert that responsibly. And, and there are a number of cities that are filing, um, a number of activist groups that are filing lawsuits against cities and municipalities specifically on either First Amendment grounds or all sorts of other um, legal bases to prevent cities from charging protesters and occupiers. But the success is very varied um, and it depends a lot on local laws. And so maybe one last question, and then I'll certainly be happy to stick around. Well, all three of you have been mentioning that training is a good thing to do. Like, where where do we turn to? Where do we start? With I would defer to our New York City yeah. state <coughs> medic to talk about Party. local training opportunities. Uh, there are several uh, active companies, mostly based in Brooklyn. Uh, the Red and Black Cross is one I mentioned. They do uh, some trainings. They've been very active at Occupy Wall Street and. Uh, they have also been training people on site there as the demand goes up. Um, I'd say that a tactical knowledge of emergency medicine in the street is, a, is an excellent resource. Anyone who would be interested in a first responder or EMTB or higher EMT level course would definitely find it useful even if they're already well versed in emergency medicine. There are also a lot of, uh, of texts on the subject ranging from uh, standards of, of emergency medical service education like Nancy Caroline's Emergency Care on the Streets, which is an excellent resource for anyone training street medics, as well as several uh, anonymously written primers which are occasionally updated by different groups depending on uh, what they're up against and uh, you know, various other factors that they, they choose to, to update on. So uh, they're, because of the amorphous and anonymous nature of the culture, it's hard to nail something down a lot of them are active on the internet, and by cert with certain search terms, you can usually track them down. Also, another uh, good idea is to go to Occupy Wall Street. Talk to some of the yeah. nurses and medics that are on duty, because they went through it, and a lot of them do it now. You there, mentioned an online guide earlier, SF, uh, SF Medics, or something we get an online training guide. Do you oh, want to write down the, uh, the website? Yeah, so actually. I think I There's also a wiki that some people are posting some trainings on. Um, or some materials on like uh, various treatment protocols. And, and when well, there's enough is, interest expressed um, out there, I mean, mm -hmm. we, we, there are enough trainers that exist in the country, we can make it happen. We're doing a training in Atlanta this upcoming weekend where some folks are flying down from Ohio to lead the training. So we, we, if there's interest expressed, we can, we can make that happen. If, if even the 20, 25 of you or so in this room, a significant portion of you expressed an interest in making it happen, I assure you we can make it happen. There's also um, wilderness first responder, wilderness EMT trainings are good options. And then for training in consensus building, um, the peace and justice communities, local peace and justice communities are often the best uh, source of trainings like that. And I don't, do you know of any, what the New York ones? 
I don't know them specifically, New York, but I but I agree. It's it's an important piece of understanding activist movements if you're not a regular <coughs> activist yourself, and you can understand how mic check doesn't actually mean shut up. I want to talk, uh, <laughs> which is in the vernacular what it's increasingly becoming. Yeah. Um, the the resources are out there. So uh, around consensus facilitation and around uh, non hierarchical groups, I know resources for the West Coast that won't be that useful for y'all. And not all activist communities are non-hierarchical. There are plenty that have oh, yeah. not engaged in that model. So, yeah. But a lot of the street medic groups that I know of are non-hierarchical. I don't know about the ones in New York. Uh, most of them are. They also kind of flit in and out of existence, like the earlier point that things used to be more organized. Um, a, lot of, uh, a, lot of these, uh, a lot of these groups and also the committees or even leaders that would run them kind of rise out of demand. If there's a, if there's a necessity to actually uh, have quick response to, to a certain scenario, there, there are the equivalents of ad hoc committees as well as ad hoc chairs of those committees that can, that can pop out. Uh, that also includes uh, incident medical command if, if necessary. So uh, in general, I'd say New York and a lot of other East Coast, uh, a lot of other East Coast outfits are generally leaderless and, and operate uh, without a hierarchy. But uh, as as circumstances demand, sometimes mm -hmm. they do, and it's usually temporary. It's usually not the same person over again. Yeah. 